Okay, let's see. We have five minutes. Okay, uh, let's see. We're up to 23. And um, let me get Bonte here. So today, um, we'll formally start this. Um, today, uh, August uh, 2nd, 2020. And uh, I'm here at the uh, Amasuka Meditation Center with Bonte Vimo Ramsey. And he will be doing uh, will be the 53, the, 53 um, um, the Disciple in Higher Training, otherwise known as Abhidhamma. But he'll tell you the he'll real you the of Abhidhamma next. Abhidhamma. So hold on for it. Okay, uh, without further ado, let me get Bhante situated here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Hello. Thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living in Sawat in the Sakian country of Kapvilavatu. Kapvilavatu was the town that Bodhisattva grew up in. Now on that, that occasion, a new assembly hall had recently been built for the Sakyans of Kapilavatu and had not yet been inhabited by any recluse or Brahmin or human being at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the Sakyans of Kapvilavatu went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, a new assembly hall has recently been built for the Sakyans of Kapvilavatu, and it has not yet been inhabited by any recluse or Brahmin or human being at all. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One be the first to use it. Then the Blessed One has used it first, then the Sakyans of Kapvilavatu will use it afterwards. That will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. The Blessed One consented in silence. Then... When they saw that he had consented, they got up from their seats and after paying homage to him, keeping him on their right, they went to the assembly hall and covered it completely with coverings and prepared seats. And they put out a large water jug and hung up an oil lamp. Uh, the thing during the time of the Buddha, they didn't have electric lights. They had these oil lamps and they, uh, they gave off very little light, to be quite honest. But the Sri Lankans, before every Dhamma talk, they liked to have an oil light, lighting ceremony where people can light one of the wicks that's in an oil. Then they went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they stood at one side and said, Venerable Sir, the assembly hall has been covered completely with coverings, and seats have been prepared. A large water jug has put, been put out and an oil lamp hung up. Now is the time for the Blessed One to do as he thinks fit. <clears throat> then the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went with the Sangha of monks to the assembly hall. When he arrived, he washed his feet and then entered the hall and sat down it by the center pillar facing the east. 
An interesting thing about facing the east is that you have a tendency to have more energy when you face east. And if you have sloth and torpor, if you, if you face the east, it will help overcome that problem. Now, if you face north, it can put you to sleep. North is a low energy, and if you have your head pointing to the north when you lay down and sleep, you'll get good sleep that way. Or if you're meditating and you have a lot of restlessness, face north and the restlessness tends to go away. <coughs> that is also with you're using the six R's and other things that I've taught you. He went to the Sangha of monks at, in the assembly hall. When he arrived, oh, he washed his feet, I did that. And the monks washed their feet and entered the hall and sat down by, <coughs> by the western wall facing the east. So basically, they sat behind the Buddha. With the Blessed One before them, the Sakyans of Kapvilavatu washed their feet, entered the hall, and sat down by the eastern wall facing the west. With the Blessed One before them. Then... When the Blessed One had instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged the Sakyans of Kapilavatu with a talk on the Dhamma, for much of the night he said to the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, speak to the Sakyans of Kapilavatu about the disciple in higher training. Higher training in Pali is Abhi Dhamma, higher Dhamma. Excuse me, I have a, a sneeze coming. <coughs> My back is uncomfortable and I will rest it. Now, an awful lot of people think that when he told Ananda to take over. This is in, in the Buddha's later life. In the last couple years of his life, his back started bothering him quite a bit. And he wasn't upset because there was pain. He just knew that he had to rest his back so that he could continue on doing things. But he didn't lie down and go to sleep. And that's kind of what... Uh, the translator here infers by his using a formula that is in a lot of other suttas about how, how to do, do the lying posture. Then the Blessed One prepared his patchwork cloak, folded in, in four, and lay down on his right side in the lion's pose. You see a lot of uh, Buddha images lying down. And you always see him with his, he's like this with his arm. They don't show you the pillow that he's got his head on, that he's, he's not just putting all the weight on his arm. Tried that for about 45 minutes. My, mind, my arm went to sleep. And it was really painful. So he did use a pillow. Okay, he, he laid down on his right side in the lion's pose and one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware. After, uh, after noting in his mind the time for rising. This is uh, part of the formula that, that it kind of looks like 
the that's too low it has to be they're yeah. complaining they can't see your face because there's something down below. because there's something down below or, yeah, there's a your name is plastic well i can't see my face now no oh. oh maybe i need to come up then. yeah is that better yes okay Anyway, during the time of the Buddha, they didn't have clocks. And the way they told time by, was by uh, a rope that was very, very big, like, like this. And they would let it smolter. And every hour they would see how far it's gone. They say, okay, that's one hour. It was, uh, that's how they to told their time. Then the Venerable Ananda addressed Mahanama, the Sakyan. Mahanama took over for the Buddha's uh, father when the father died. He was the oldest son. He was the Buddha's brother. And he was a monk when his father died. And he was in the room as the father died. And he, uh, they were looking for somebody to, to become the Sakyan ruler. And they couldn't find anybody. So the Buddha said, well, we have to have somebody that's virtuous. To us. And he said, okay, Mahanama, you become the next, the next king. And uh, you can, you can start ruling. And his father agreed that that was a good thing. So he disrobed and became a layman and became a king. Mahanama, here a noble disciple, <coughs> excuse me, a noble disciple is possessed of virtue, guards the doors of his sense faculties, is moderate in eating, and devoted to wakefulness. He possesses seven good qualities. And he is one who obtains at will without trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. The way meditation is being taught now, there's some real confusion that's happening because of uh, the Burmese style of meditation. They don't like to have people doing jhana practice. They want you to do insight only. And that's caught on here in this country. So, I'll, there's some confusion about this, and it's the uh, the real problem because the Buddha very often talks about the jhanas in the suttas and explains that the suttas have, they they uh, need to be practiced. But because of the confusion with straight vipassana meditation, uh, the pe some people are being led astray from the Buddha's teaching. Now, there, there's a funny experience that I, I had a student that had been teaching Goenka style meditation for 20 years. He's been teaching a lot of people. And he came and he started practicing with me. 
And because he started using the six R's and the relax step, one day he walked in for the interview and he was lit up. I mean, he was very happy. And I said, well, what's happening? And he said, after 20 years, I finally understand what a pleasant abiding is. And he thought that was just great. Anyway, it, it, the, the jhanas constitute the higher mind. Not the worldly mind. Your mind is very pure when you're in a jhana. Why is it pure? Because there is no craving that arises. There's no hindrances that arise while you are practicing and are in a jhana. And how is a noble disciple possessed of virtue? Here a noble disciple is virtuous. He dwells restrained by the restraint of the Padi Mokha. The Padi Mokha is the rules for monks. Now you have five precepts, right? I have 227. But that doesn't mean that you have to follow the way that I'm doing it. Keeping the five precepts purifies your mind enough. Now, you have hindrances that arise. And they distract your mind when you're meditating. Why do hindrance arise, hindrances arise? What's the cause of a hindrance? The cause of a hindrance is breaking a precept at some point in your life. So you break a precept and you know you've done something that's not good. And you start to feel guilty because of that. And then you start, because of that guilty feeling, you start taking your thoughts and feelings personally. This is me, this is mine, this is who I am. When you're using the six R's, you are learning how to let go of that past unwholesome action that you did. And this purifies your mind. In other words, as soon as you relax and let go of the craving, you will have a mind that's clear, that's very bright and alert and pure. Why is it pure? Because you have let go of craving. Craving is very misunderstood throughout the world. Wherever I teach, most people don't understand what craving is or how to let it go. Yeah, and I, I spent 12 years in Asia looking for somebody to tell me what craving actually was, and nobody could. How are you supposed to recognize it? Well, it's just desire. If you let go of desire, then you, uh, then you will be letting go of the craving. And it doesn't quite work like that. What is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. When a pleasant feeling arises, I like it. When a painful feeling arises, I don't like it. When you are able to recognize that slight tension and tightness that happens in the head and relax, you will notice 
that your mind is clear. Your mind is very alert and bright. And there's no distracting thoughts. Now, one another thing that happens with an awful lot of people, and that is they have, everybody is supposed to know what the word mindfulness is supposed to be. And there's a lot of definitions out there about mindfulness. I went to a mindfulness conference. And when it was my turn to get up and talk, that was the first thing I said was, okay, you, we've been talking about mindfulness all this conference. Can anybody give me a definition of what mindfulness is? And there was words like awareness. And that's a very weak meaning. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Now this works 100% of the time. Your mind is on your object of meditation, all of a sudden you're thinking about this or that. How did that happen? We don't care why it happened. We want to be able to see how this process actually works. And as, as you keep practicing with the six R's, you start having insights into how it actually works. Now this is insights while you're in the jhana. So this is a little bit different than is being taught right now. Okay. <clears throat> now, keeping the precepts, uh, when I got back from Asia, I start talking about the precepts and mind, everybody's mind just turned off. Yeah, 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 we know what it is. But they didn't practice it. Now, if you want to try an experiment, break a precept. Say something that's not true. And watch what happens with your sitting meditation. All of a sudden, you have a hindrance. Where did that hindrance come from? Well, it came from you. Now the thing is that hindrances are, well, that was interesting. Hindrances are not your enemy to fight with. Hindrances are your teachers. They're showing you where in the past you made a mistake, and now you want to purify your mind, so you use the six R's. So it comes up to showing you that you have a, a past thing that's blocking your meditation. Now you need to use the six R's and let go of that distraction. Don't make a big deal of it in your mind. The second step of the six R's is okay. He just did something. The second step of the six R's is release. Release what? Release the distraction that's causing your mind to get distracted. How do you release it? You don't keep your attention on that distraction. 
no matter how big or how painful it happens to be. Then you relax. Now you bring up something that's wholesome. I'm real big on smiling. Why am I real big on smiling? The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The more alert your mind becomes. One of the big problems with uh, meditation as it's being taught right now is everybody gets way too serious and they start trying to control and push and make things be the way they want it to be. And that causes us a lot of pain. Meditation is supposed to be light. It's supposed to be fun. Every time I give a retreat, I'm continually talking about have fun. Don't be serious. I've been to a lot of meditation retreats. And the first 20 years of my practice was with the meditation retreats of Masi Sayada. When you walk into a room where there's 20, 30, 40, 50 people that are sitting in meditation, you don't see anybody smile. Not one time. And when you walk in, you feel this tightness and tension that's happening in your mind. Why does that, why is that there? Now, I asked the Mahasi teachers, why? I don't, I didn't want to have any painful thing coming up in my head. They told me, oh, just ignore it. It's nothing. It'll go away by itself eventually. Well, as I started experiencing more and more with the suttas themselves and seeing what the answer was, it was craving. And they weren't able to recognize it as craving. They didn't know how to let craving go. So there's a, a problem that's happening with an awful lot of people that are doing the practice. And the problem is they try too hard. You get too serious and then you start trying to force your mind to be the way you want it to be. Now I'm constantly telling people to smile. I'm constantly telling people to laugh. Oh, while you're in meditation, it's okay to laugh? Well, of course it is. Your mind's crazy. Might as well laugh with it, right? Smile, laugh, have fun. Turn this into a game rather than a serious problem. Why do I say that? Well, when you were in school and you had a favorite subject, what kind of grade did you get in that subject? That's pretty good, right? Why? Because it was fun. And you, you liked it. Well, do that with the meditation. Don't make it some kind of big, hard, difficult thing to do. Turn it into fun. When you do that, I promise you, your meditation will, your meditation progress will improve faster than you ever thought possible. So, When you keep your precepts without breaking them, the longer you do it, it turns into a protection for you. 
and you will be able to recognize when other people are, you're around other people that have a tendency to break precepts and you won't feel very comfortable around them. They won't feel particularly comfortable around you. I've had some relatives that were into their alcohol. They were really into drinking and, and breaking all kinds of precepts. And whenever I went to see them, I would start radiating loving kindness to them. And it was so uncomfortable for them being beside me that they got up and left the room. That's a, a, a phenomena that can happen. I can remember when I was in San Francisco many years ago, I was a layman at the time, but I'd been doing a lot of meditation. And I went to a party where there was smoking pot and they were drinking alcohol and they were generally being rowdy. And I wasn't interested of being around them. So I just kind of sat by myself and I thought, well, I wonder what happens when you radiate loving kindness to these folks. As I was radiating loving kindness, people got up and left the room. They went to another room where they could be sloppy with their mindfulness. And before long, I was sitting in the room. There was 20 people at this party, but I was sitting in the room by myself. And I was just about ready to get up and leave. And some of the uh, boyfriends or girlfriends, they weren't into doing the alcohol and all of that. They started coming back into the room. And we had a great night talking about spiritual things. So it's a kind of protection. It stops you from being around unwholesome people. So now it says, after keeping the precept, he is perfect in conduct and resort. And seeing fear in the slightest fault, he trains by undertaking the training precepts. <clears throat> this is how a noble disciple is possessed of virtue. Now I'm going to go to another sutta for just a little uh, thing that talks about what you do when you keep your precepts. Let's see. Uh, while you're doing that, Bhante, uh, while you're doing that, Bhante, let me just say, uh, Martina, if you just mute yourself, it will stop flashing to you. If there's any noise in your room, it just flashes over to you. Thanks. Okay. This is from the Kosamian Sutta, number 48. This is section 11. A noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down. This, is, this means you made a mistake, you said something that wasn't true, or you broke one of the precepts. Now you can be rehabilitated and you can rehabilitate yourself the thing with breaking a precept is as soon as you break the precept, your mind very quietly says, I shouldn't have done that. And you know that you did it. 
Now, what do you do when you recognize that you've broken a precept? Now, what you need to do is forgive yourself for making a mistake. Take the precepts again. It doesn't matter whether it's out loud, out loud or in your mind, but take the five precepts again with a strong determination that you won't do that again. Now, when you, when you treat breaking the precepts this way, you will start to become more and more aware that, well, I broke a precept. And now you're going to let it go. And you'll notice that your sitting meditation has fewer and fewer hindrances arising. There's still going to be hindrances come up. But it's going to be fewer. Now, I had one student that I taught him for many, many, many years. He did every retreat that I gave. He, he was there at the retreat. And when he got off retreat, he said, okay, I'm off retreat. I don't have to do anything with the precepts. I'm going to go back to being the way I was. And I kept telling him, he, he used to curse a lot. He, he liked dirty jokes. So he was always using foul language. If he came for a two-week retreat, the first 10 days of the retreat was full of hindrances. It took him a long time to settle down. Finally, when he purified his mind enough, then he started progressing, but he was only progressing for two or three days before he, at the end of the retreat. And it happened like that continually. Every time he did a retreat, and he, I kept on telling him, if you stop, using the foul language, then you're going to progress much faster. It only took him 30 or 35 years to figure that out. But when he did figure it out, all of a sudden his progress in the meditation really took off. That's wonderful. So, it's a real good idea for you to take the, the precepts pretty seriously. Okay, uh, although he may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has laid, been laid down, still he at once confesses, reveals, and dis discloses to the teacher or a wise companion in the holy life. Having done that, he enters upon restraint for the future. Just as a young, tender infant lying prone uh, at once draws back when he puts his hand or foot on a live coal. So too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. So you can see that this, this is fairly important. This is why you will progress very fast when you keep the precepts. And it won't be very fast if you don't. And you're in charge. You are your own teacher. I'm not your teacher. I'm a guide. I find out how your meditation is going and I might give you some suggestions. And if you follow them, 
then you're going to be successful with your meditation. The progress in meditation can be very fast. I know I did 12 three-month retreats at one point. I was doing heavy-duty retreats all the time. No progress, not really. I did an eight-month retreat in Burma. I did a two-year retreat in Burma before I became disillusioned after 20 years of doing the same practice and not being successful with that practice but being told that I was successful, uh, I started looking for other kinds of practice. So I went to the suttas themselves. Okay. This is how a noble disciple is possessed of virtue. And how does a noble disciple guard the doors of his sense faculties? On seeing a form with the eye, a noble disciple does not grasp at its signs and features. And start thinking about what you're seeing instead of staying with your object of meditation. That takes you away from your object of meditation and turns into a, a disturbance. Now this doesn't mean that you can't see and appreciate beautiful things. A flower can be very beautiful. But if you start thinking, oh, you know, I saw that flower last year and it was absolutely gorgeous. I remember when I gave one of those to somebody else. All of a sudden, you're not being with your spiritual friend or your object of meditation. And you're just caught up in thinking. So that's a problem. So the, you want to be able to Keep the six R's close, okay? Use the six R's whenever there's distraction. Since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices a way of its restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind. A noble disciple does not grasp at its signs and features, since if he left that those faculties unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices a way of its restraint. He guards these faculties. He undertakes the restraint of the faculties. That is how a noble disciple guards the doors of his sense faculties. And how is a noble disciple moderate in eating? Here, reflecting wisely, a noble disciple takes food neither for amusement nor for intoxication or for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness but only for the endurance and continuance of this body. In discomfort and for assisting the holy life. 
The Buddha suggested that you eat until your stomach is half full with food. Then you drink a quarter of your stomach's capacity with water and you leave air for the rest of it. He also suggested that when you chew your food, you chew the food until it becomes liquid in your mouth. Until you, you really uh, chew your food a lot. Now, an awful lot of people, especially in, in Asian countries, they wind up with bad stomachs because they eat their food too fast. And the first part of digestion is the saliva that you have from your mouth intermixing with the well-chewed food. If it's just chomp, 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 swallow, then you have these big lumps and it's hard to digest in your stomach and that causes problems for your health. So taking more time to eat and chew your food is very important. Now, one of the things that monks do is they only eat between six o'clock in the morning and high noon. And I only eat one time a day. Now, I stay healthy because of this. I fast for 16 hours a day. And this is good for your health. I know a lot of people that, oh, I have to have my evening meal. I have to eat first thing in the morning. I have to eat. Uh, no, you don't really need to. In the morning, either drink water or you can have a cup of coffee or tea, whatever you like but no solid food. And that way you stay healthy. Now, when I was in Australia many years ago, I, was, I went all the way through a cold season where there was frost on the ground until oh, 10 or 11 o'clock in, in the morning. I was only eating one meal a day I didn't get sick. Then it got to be the warmer season. Spring was coming and, and I started going in and hanging out with the monks. And they were eating breakfast and I wound up taking a little bit here and a little bit there. And before long I was eating a full meal in the breakfast and I immediately caught a cold. As soon as I noticed I caught the cold, I stopped eating altogether. I laid down and rested. I took vitamin C and the cold lasted about eight hours. Now, a lot of times you feel a cold coming on and if I come around, I say, oh, you feel, you, you feel bad, go take rest. No, I have to go to work. I have to do this. I have to do that. Well, you have about a two-hour window from when you feel achy in your body that you need to lie down in that period of time or else the cold is going to catch you and it's going to last for... Oh, 10 days, two weeks, something like that. So if you learn to recognize when you start feeling a cold coming on, you stop eating. If you need to eat, just 
eat some rice soup without any meat in it, without any other vegetables, just rice soup, and lay down and rest. Now, when I say lay down and rest, I mean don't listen to music, don't uh, watch TV, don't read a book, lay down and rest. And when you feel like you, you want to go to sleep, go to sleep. That's fine. Then you'll overcome this cold very quickly. This is not the advice that you hear by most people, especially doctors. They like you to eat a lot, especially when you're sick. But I've been doing this for 35 or 40 years. And occasionally I do catch some kind of a cold. Then I stop eating immediately and just lay down and rest. And in a short period of time, I'm over the cold. But anybody else that I'm with they keep trying to power their way through it. Oh, I can overcome this. And all I have to do is take this medicine and that'll get rid of it. It's not the medicine that's needed. What's actually needed is rest. Give your body a chance to heal itself. Okay. And how is a noble disciple devoted to wakefulness? Here during the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, a noble disciple purifies his mind of obstructive states, hindrances. In the first watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. The first watch of the night is 7 o'clock in the evening until 11 o'clock in the evening. In the middle watch of the night, he lies down on his right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other. The middle watch of the night is 11 o'clock until 3 o'clock in the morning. After rising in the third watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. The third watch is three o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock. Now, when I was in Burma for eight months, I lived like that. Well, actually, it was five months I lived like that. And then my teacher said, why are you being so lazy and sleeping so much? So I cut my sleeping down to two hours. I don't recommend it. It took me six weeks to recover from <laughs> being so tired. Anyway, this is how a noble disciple is devoted to wakefulness. And how does a noble disciple possess seven good qualities? Here a noble disciple has faith. He places his faith in the Tathagata's awakening thus. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct. Sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. Now, I've had some, some students that have had extreme fear. And what I, what I told them to do was recite this. The Blessed One is accomplished, uh, fully awakened, perfect in truth, knowledge, and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable, leader of persons to be tamed, 
teacher of gods and humans awakened and blessed. And I get them to recite that every day for a period of time and the fear starts to go away by itself. Now fear is a yeah, kind I forgot of about feeling. That. Okay. The fastest and easiest way to overcome fear is by laughing. Laugh because you have the fear. Laugh at how crazy it is because it came up. As soon as you do that, the identification with the fear, the fear I am afraid, I am disappears and it turns into be only being a feeling. Now, did you sit there and tell yourself, I have to be afraid right now because I haven't been afraid for a long time? No, it happens because conditions are right for it to arise. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. If you fight with what's happening in the present, if you try to control it, if you indulge in it, if you try to make it be the way you want it to be, you can look forward to having a lot bigger and more intense fear arising. Or if you keep your mind light and kind of laugh with it because it's not yours. You didn't ask it to come up. You can't make it go away. So why get involved with it? Now this is the second step of the six R's. Release it. Let it be there by itself. Don't get involved with it. It's only a feeling. It's not even your feeling. So let it be. He has shame. He is ashamed of misconduct in body, speech, and mind. Ashamed of engaging in evil and wholesome uh, deeds. It is good to develop that so you become more aware. When you want to do something and right before you do it, you become aware of what you're doing and you back off. You don't do it. He has fear of wrongdoing. He's afraid of misconduct in body, speech, and mind afraid of engaging in evil, unwholesome deeds. Again, being ashamed of doing it and having fear of doing it will keep your mindfulness more clear. And you will start to see and appreciate the effectiveness of keeping your precepts without breaking them. He has learned much. What he has learned and consolidates what he has learned. Such teachings are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. With the right meaning and phrasing, and affirm a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these, he has learned much of, remembered, recited verbally, investigated with the mind and penetrated well by view. It's a good idea to memorize some of the easier suttas to memorize. They aren't long, they're easy to memorize. 
like overcoming fear by looking at the good qualities of the Buddha. It's a good idea to do that. You can do it in Pali or you can do it in English. It's up to you. You see a lot of monks walking around with this row of beads. There's 108 beads in there uh, that they carry. They use that as a counter so that you can do this three or four times in a sitting and you won't lose track. He is energetic in abandoning unwholesome states. Energetic in using the six R's. And in undertaking wholesome states. He is steadfast, firm in striving. Not remiss in developing wholesome, wholesome states. He has mindfulness. He is possessed of the highest mindfulness and skill. Remember, it's remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. As you go deeper into your meditation, you'll start to see more and more quickly when there is some disturbance of mind and you can use the six R's right then. As soon as you do that, then you'll start seeing more and more subtle little tiny things that can arise. He recalls and recollects what was done long ago and spoken long, spoken long ago. He is wise. He possesses wisdom regarding the rise and disappearance that is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. That is how a noble disciple possesses good qualities. And how is a noble disciple one who obtains at will without any trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind? and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. Now what, what I do with people is I will teach them and then I will, uh, when, when they are successful with the practice, then I will teach them how to gain mastery of going in and out of any of the jhanas at will. And I teach that, and there's a lot of usefulness in that. A lot of people have an idea that jhana is just for sitting meditation. And you can be in a jhana when you're in a crowd of people. You can, if you want to affect that people with an uplifted mind, you can start radiating loving kindness to those people and get into the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. You can do that with loving kindness. It's up to you. And the more you practice this, the better you get at being able to go in and out of a jhana whenever you want the more successful you are and more, the more people around you become happy. Here secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A noble disciple enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away as joy, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pleasure nor pain, impurity of mindfulness, duty, equanimity. That is how a noble disciple is one 
who obtains at will without trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. When a noble disciple has thus become one who is possessed of virtue, who guards the doors of his sense faculties, who is moderate in eating, who is devoted to wakefulness, who possesses seven good qualities at will, and who obtains at will, without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. He is one called in higher training who has entered upon the way. His eggs are unspoiled. He is capable of breaking out, capable of awakening, capable of attaining the superior, the supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Suppose there was a hen with eight or 10 or 12 eggs which she had covered, incubated, and nurtured properly. Even though she did not wish or uh, think, oh, that my chicks might pierce the shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatch out safely. Yet the chicks are capable of piercing their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatch out safely. So too, when a noble disciple has thus become one who is possessed of virtue and the rest and is called in, in higher training, who has entered upon the way, his eggs are unspoiled. He is capable of breaking out, capable of awakening, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Having arrived at the same supreme mindfulness, whose purity is due to equanimity, this noble disciple recollects his manifold past lifetimes. I'm not going to get into this part of the, of the uh, sutta because it takes a lot longer kind of explanation and this is turning into a long talk. <laughs> Although I can't see a clock to tell what time oh, it is. Yeah, okay. So... Then the Blessed One rose and addressed the Venerable Ananda thus, Good, good, Ananda, it is good that you have spoken to the Sakyans of Kapilavatu about the disciple in higher training who has entered upon the way. That is what the Venerable Ananda said. The teacher approved the Sakyans of Kapilavatu were then satisfied and delighted in the venerable Ananda's words. So this sutta it has a lot of information in it that is very useful in a practical way. And if you are serious about wanting to experience what the Buddha was talking about, 
I highly suggest you follow these instructions. What the Buddha was talking about. I, I highly recommend that you follow what the Buddha suggests. It works. I promise. It works. I have many, many students that are successful in their meditation. Their life has changed. They become more happy, more uplifted, and more alert. And they don't get caught up in emotional upsets like something like this coronavirus that's happening right now. They don't become upset because of that. It's just what's happening right now. This is happening in the present moment. Why get upset by it? Why try to fight with it? Why become dissatisfied with it? It's just what's happening right now, and that will change on its own. And in, in maybe four months, five months, six months, you won't even remember about this time because it's not so important. So, turn life into a game. Laugh. Smile, have fun. The more you do that, the better your mindfulness becomes. The more you smile into what you're doing while you do it, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. Every time you use the six R's, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. You are practicing the Four Noble Truths at that time. This is why it's so important to understand, to remember to use the six R's often whether you're sitting in meditation or not. If a hindrance comes up and you get knocked over by it, it's emotional pain and suffering or physical pain and suffering. Let it be there by itself. Don't get involved with it. Don't try to make it change. Don't indulge in it. Allow it to be by itself. Then relax into it. And you'll see that your mind becomes much more clear, more bright, more alert, more pure. So the more you can practice this way, the easier the meditation becomes and the more fun the meditation becomes. Now, do you have any questions? Uh, hello, Bonte. Hello. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, Sometimes when I do uh, like the six R's, if I do the loving kindness, sometimes I'll feel like something jump up in my heart and my heart will like skip a bit. I'm wondering what that is. Oh, you're just starting to let go of some old attachments. Oh, okay. It's nothing to be over concerned with. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, what else? Second question. I think in one of the talks you said uh, not to mix disciplines. Were you referring to like Vipassana and six R's? It doesn't work so good. Your mind gets confused. Right. 
stick with the six R's. That has been proven to be very good and you get a successful end result if you follow the rest of the directions. Cool. Now I did straight Vipassana for 20 years. I do understand this. And I understand all of the insight knowledges that you're supposed to have because I experienced them. But it didn't lead to the experience of Nibbana. Not as it's described in the suttas. There could be some people that might luck out and they experience uh, some some types of Nibbana. But it's only maybe one every 500,000 or so that has that experience. I just, I, I spent, I gave retreats for about 200 people in India. Half experience some form of Nibbana. Half. That's a lot different than one every 500,000 people. And it's because of learning to recognize the craving and how to let it go. How to practice the six R's. It works. I see some of the people that have been practicing with me here and they, they have successful practice. And they do very nicely with their daily activities. They don't get so caught up and upset. So it, it really does work. Okay. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, Bente. Hello. It's good to hear you here. Um, <laughs> thank you for your teaching. Yeah, it's just, um, you just said today, um, the inside, we have insight, we can see inside or we feel inside while yeah. in the jhana. Right. Right, and so this is like now with the calling the intuition, like calling my intuition saying I want to have an insight or something. We just allow that insight to arise or to come and we notice. Well, of course. It's, it's like all of a sudden you've been wrestling with a problem and now you got the answer. Oh. That's an insight, isn't like it? That. Right, coming just there. During yeah. the meditation, during the jhana, right? During it could be at any time. Any time. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. And it makes you real happy because you figured something out. You saw how you were doing something that uh, caused pain, and now you figured out what it is and how to let it go. That's a great insight. Right especially when I'm not looking for it, it's coming, right? right. Um, and so that, that is different than before on your teaching? That you no, did, not really. No, really, it was the same, but kind of, yeah. I, did, I yeah. didn't explain it quite the same way before. Okay. Just want to change my way, uh, not way, but opening this a little bit more. That's what okay. I'm asking the question, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's great to see you again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to come and visit me? Well, I would love to. Uh, I would love to. I just was wondering how to do this with, uh, you know, the virus. Like it's. Um... Well, they'll let you go from one state to another. It's not much of a big deal. It's just that the, you know, we are so confined in the Bay Area. We just don't have, you know, it's so heavy here about cannot move out of your home without a mask and everything that 
I feel like I don't know what to do for the plane. I mean, you did it. I mean, you came back from India, right? So yeah. So you kind of went, you were staying in your meditation, in your jhana, and just allow this to not having anything coming to your body, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. And um, I would love to get you out of California. They're crazy there. Oh, it's so, um, you know, I went to South of California to breathe because there was much easier, not coming south, but in the middle. And that was really nice landscape space away from the bay. But thank you for your invitation. I will allow that to come in. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good. I look forward to it. Anybody else have a question? Wendy, I have one question. Okay. Um, when I'm doing my uh, forgiveness meditation, uh -huh. like it's very tight here. Like I can't verbalize it. Well, you're doing, you're trying too hard. You're trying to push that feeling the way you want it to go instead of just forgive it for not, un forgive yourself for not understanding. Forgive yourself for getting caught by your desires. Okay, the more you forgive, lightly, the easier it becomes. Thank you. Don't try too hard. Don't try to force it. That's, that's where you wind up with a tight mind. Okay. Okay? Thank you. And please smile more. Okay? Okay. All right. Bhante, yeah. uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, it's regarding my practice. So when I am when I'm with equanimity, uh, if there is any disturbance is coming, I'm just bringing up uh, the tranquility. So it's becoming balanced. But uh, this uh, imbalance is coming quite often. It's what do you mean by imbalance? You mean uh, feeling the radiation of the equanimity disappears? Uh, yeah. Okay. And because because of there is a disturbance of mind. Well, you're, mind you're holding is... on too tight to the equanimity. When it disappears, now you take mind as your object of meditation. And it's just, there's nothing. There's not going to be any movement of mind's attention. There's not going to be any thoughts. It's just going to be quiet. And use the quiet mind as your object of meditation. Don't hold on to the equanimity. Just let the mind be quiet. If you see the slightest thought starting to come up, as soon as you see that, relax and come back to the quiet mind. Don't get involved with it. Okay? Okay, but you're I not think... doing anything wrong. You're just going from one level to another now. And this is a good thing. Okay? I think uh, you are right. I was actually holding tight for. Yeah. yeah, you're holding on a little bit too much, and that's okay. Forgive yourself for doing that. It's no big deal. Just don't do it anymore. Just allow that quiet mind to come. Thank you, Vante. Uh, I have some students that can sit with a quiet mind without any movement of mind's attention for an hour. Okay, so that gives you an idea how you can do that. Okay. And if you, if you have the time, now is the time to sit longer. Okay. Yeah. If, if you can afford to do that. I have one student that he is retired, so he doesn't have the responsibility of having to go to work and support himself. He's already retired. But he gets up 
very early in the morning, like four o'clock, and he, he will sit in meditation until seven o'clock. So he'll sit for three hours. That's quite good. If you can do that, and, and everybody is different, so it's okay. If you don't have the time to do it, don't worry about it. As long as you sit every day, you will progress in your meditation. Now, if you can only sit for an hour in the day, your progress is not going to be so fast. If you can sit for two hours at one time, your progress is going to do better. If you can do three hours, it can do even better. But that depends on you and your situation. You, you get to decide, to decide for yourself whether you want to do that or whether you can do that. It's up to you, your life, right? Thank you, Bhante. I also want to share a few changes I am experiencing. I, I uh, didn't quite hear you. you I want to, to share, uh, like, I have been practicing Twim um, uh, since one month. I was, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of changes, a uh, lot of positive changes for me. Good. Uh, actually, my, my wife is saying that you changed a lot. <laughs> She's a better person. <laughs> Good. You practice laughing with her and having fun with her, and that will help your relationship with her very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I, I can, I can for sure say that you, you impacted a positive change in my life. I can say that. Well, thank you. I, that makes me happy to be able to help you. Thank you, Bante. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? Hi, Bhante. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm, Good. Uh, very happy and joyful today. Excellent. That makes me happy, you know. Um, so you, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So I've had uh, a lot of questions coming up over the, the past weeks. Um, kind of all about the, the precepts and especially the, uh, the fourth precept about, you know, right speech, about not lying and no harsh speech. Right. Um, and uh, one of the questions that actually came up about a month ago uh, was when I think David was sharing a sutta about uh, the Buddha talking um, to an actor and the actor was really pressing him for sort of where am I going to go and uh, I think the from what I remember, basically the Buddha said he was going, going to be reborn in a really uh, low state because of his profession. Um, so, I mean, does that mean that, um, what, what I understood from that was that, you know, by acting and sort of creating fiction in these sort of stories that aren't real, is that, a, is that to be understood as a form of deception and, and breaking the precept? Is, am I understanding that correctly? Nah, stories are understood by everybody, so it's not that it, it might be a fantasy story, but if it has a, a moral of the story to it, it's not breaking a precept. Mm, okay. Mm. Okay, this has to be intentionally trying to fool other people. Okay. 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 So I think that kind of answers my second question, but let me just check to be sure. Um, like sarcasm, you know, is, is literally, as I understand it, you know, saying one thing but meaning another, but it's often meant as a joke. So if, if the intent and if the understanding, if it's understood that you're not actually, that it is actually a joke, then that's also not breaking the precept. That's well, right. Look at the reaction you get from using sarcasm, and yet generally it's not a good reaction from other people. Mm. So it's better to stay away from that kind of speech. Right, okay. Say things that make people laugh. 
say things that make people happy to hear. Mm. Okay. And so what if you're sort of around people that don't always, pre you know, hold the precepts correctly? Like you, you mentioned earlier, like uh, if it's family, for example, and you're sort of people that you're living with. Well, one of the things I found when I started doing so much with meditation and that was that my old friends were boring and I started getting new friends and they were interesting but we were heading in the right in the same direction basically and people that break precepts all the time they're boring to be around they're, they're, you're not comfortable around them so you just don't be around them as much and they'll fade away on their own so just keep practicing the precepts yeah, but you you be the example of using right speech. And when you're the example, then other people start following that. Mm. Okay. okay. No. Anything else? Yeah, the, there's one more question. So I was listening to uh, one of the Dhamma talks you gave um, and you were talking about the, I think you were talking about a story of a woman whose daughter was eaten by a shark. And yes. You're, you're really encouraging her to sort of uh, let the pain come up and, and sort of. Um, well, I, the I, truth I, is the pain is going to come up on its own, whether she wanted it to or not. What I was trying to do was to get her to accept the pain without trying to push it away or try to. Uh, get over involved in the sadness of the situation. Mm. So, it, so it's not necessarily about encouraging her to express it. It's it's just more about not trying. No, to not it. really. Okay. The, I, I was trying to encourage her to stay with the present, even though the present has a lot of pain in it. Don't fight. Don't fight or resist. Soften your mind as much as you can. Now there was, there was extreme sadness. Okay, the sadness was there. You're not supposed to be smiling and happy when that kind of sadness can overwhelm you. So allow it to be there don't resist it. Don't try to push it away. Soften your mind as much as you can. And eventually it changes and goes away. Okay? Okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Oh. Okay. Happy to help you in whatever way I can. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Bhante. Okay, Bhante, it looks like that's it. Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadu, sadu, sadu.